Before we start, I'd just like to acknowledge um, that uh, we're meeting today on the lands of the Warren, uh, Wurundjeri people um, of the Kulin Nation, and we pay our respects um, to uh, their elders, uh, past and present. Um, just uh, one other matter. Uh, we are recording today's session, so um, both uh, uh, audio and visual. Uh, so if uh, you have some reservations about that, please uh, contact one of our staff um, uh, now. Um, just uh, a little bit about the uh, tax clinic. Uh, this uh, is one of the presentations, uh, public information uh, sessions for um, the uh, Melbourne Law School Tax Clinic, which is uh, funded by the um, uh, Australian government and uh, supported by, with the generous help of uh, many tax practitioners here in Melbourne. Um, the uh, purpose of the tax clinic is not only to run these public information sessions, but also to um, uh, help people who are unrepresented uh, in their dealings with the taxation office. So if uh, you would like to find out more about um, uh, the services that uh, may be available to you, please contact one of our uh, staff uh, in the foyer um, at the end of today's session. Um, the uh, purpose of today's uh, session, as you can see from the uh, slides behind me, is uh, consideration of the tax issues uh, arising from uh, or for those working in the gig economy. And uh, I don't want to um, uh, uh, take or steal the thunder of our presenters, so I'll leave uh, those, uh, our two presenters, uh, two principal presenters, um, to introduce uh, their, uh, their topics. However, before we do that, I'd just like to firstly introduce Lisa Gregg, um, who has uh, very substantial experience in uh, tax advisory work and also a very keen interest in uh, tax, tax policy. Uh, I'd also like to introduce Professor John Howe, who uh, is currently the director of uh, the Melbourne School of Government, and uh, he brings uh, enormous experience in um, labour uh, law and regulation and employment law. And uh, so with uh, Lisa's experience uh, principally in taxation law and uh, John's experience in um, employment law, we are hoping that uh, today will be a very uh, informative session. Uh, we will end with a Q&A session where we have uh, Gabrielle uh, Marchetti, uh, who is the principal lawyer um, at JobWatch. And uh, she uh, is down the front here, but uh, you will uh, see uh, her uh, come to the front uh, for the uh, Q&A session. Uh, so um, she will also be able to share her uh, considerable knowledge in the, uh, in the uh, field of employment law uh, for those of you that may have any questions about that. So without any further ado, um, I'd like to introduce uh, Lisa and uh, hand over. Thanks. Okay, it's a topical thing, but has everyone here got a tax file number? Hands up, tax file number, everyone got a tax file number? Has everyone met all their tax obligations for 30 June 2018? Because they're due tomorrow, <laughs> if you're going through. <laughs> everyone has? I hope so. Um, even if you think, it's interesting though, even if you think that you haven't got any income to declare or anything, as soon as you get a tax file number, you still need to tell the ATO that you don't need to lodge a return. So you've still got these obligations, which is quite interesting. And I'll talk about a little bit later that the ATO have got a significant amount of, amount of powerful data behind them. So. Big Brother is definitely watching you. So what we're talking about today is the gig economy, the sharing economy, um, side hustles. It seems to be, I think, the state of play now um, that everyone's doing something different with their job. You know, whether it's I started off life doing chemistry and doing biotech, and now I'm doing um, accounting and uh, being a tax advisor to small business. So everyone sort of changes their roles and I think now there's plenty of opportunity for people to do their nine to five job but also probably do things that they're passionate about and I think this is where it's come from the rock in the gig economy. And what people don't really realise is that if you do what we call personal exertion or do some work, do some services and you get paid for it, You've got to bring that in and, and, and the ATO wants some of that money. The government want to bring that money into Treasury. So that's one thing that you have to realise that you could be working on one of the platforms like say an Airtasker and you've decided you're going to help someone um, put together an IKEA 
um, bookshelf or something like that, or you might be doing an Uber or and driving around for someone, or um, you could be actually making cupcakes and selling them at the local farmer's market. All that sort of income is considered taxable income, and so you need to bring that in to um, your uh, tax return uh, at any point in time. So that's what you need to be aware of with the gig economy, OK? Now, some people think that it could be just a hobby and things like that. We're not talking about you know, selling your old CD collection on Gumtree or something like that. We're actually talking about doing paid work for service similar to mowing lawns and things like that, OK? And it's interesting to note, and since we're at the university, I thought I'd bring this in, you need to bring the uh, income to account for the tax office, even if it's illegal. So this is a picture of um, contract cheating, which is very big at the university from what I've heard. Um, so even if it's an illegal activity, whether you're you know, selling drugs or doing things that could be a little bit immoral or anything like that, that is still considered taxable income and the ATR will want, want to see that as well. So I thought it'd be interesting to say that. There is a tax case that's been around um, that says even if it's illegal, you still need to bring it in. We won't talk about the other parts of the law, but from in terms of tax law goes, yep, the ATR will still want to see that. However, what you do need to be aware of is if you're Uber driving or using any of the other um, ride sharing, um, getting uh, income from ride sharing. So ride sourcing, as you can see from there, ride sourcing is an ongoing arrangement where you're a driver making a car available for public hire, a passenger using a website or app to provide um, to a third party, um, or you use your car to transport the passenger for a fee. So we're saying it's passenger, it's not your Deliveroo at the moment. What it is, is you're considered to be a taxi service. And there's special rules around taxi services. So where, if you were doing some service on Airtasker, for example, you can just bring the income in and just declare it, and you're all fine in terms of tax compliance and the tax rules. If you've, you are considered a taxi service, um, you need to be have an ABN, so you need to apply for an ABN. And you also need to be registered for GST. Okay, so you need to charge GST on those services, or the platform usually does it for you. Normally, with GST, it's only once you earn seventy-five thousand dollars in turnover, you need to be registered. But with Uber and the other types of ride-sharing services, you do need to be registered. Now, the interesting part of this is, you might go, "Oh, I'll go and do some um, ride-sharing for." one session or something like that, and then you go, oh, I don't really like this. You've still got ongoing tax compliance obligations. You've still got an ABN. You've still got to register for GST and put in a business activity statement every quarter, even if it's zero. As I said at the beginning, you know, if you've got a tax file, num a tax file number and the ATR expecting a tax return from you, even if it's nil income, you've still got to put one in. There's ongoing compliance obligations with these ride sharing. So that's what they're considering at the moment is if it's passenger, it's considered a taxi service and they haven't caught up with you know, delivering fast food or anything like that yet. So just be aware of that, that there is ongoing obligations with that. Now, you th might think that it's OK, I've got cash or it just goes into my bank account, no one will know about it. The ATO have got very sophisticated computer services and data matching that occurs. Okay, everyone might have a MyGov account and things like that. The information that goes into your MyGov goes to all the government departments, DHS and everything like that. I've had clients where they've said, we're an Australian resident, we're not an Australian resident or we are an Australian resident, they'll go to immigration data. So as soon as you scan your passport through, there's all this data information that's available to the ATO. So what the ATO will do will actually look even at, look at bank accounts. With the various platforms that you use for the gig economy, that information will be voluntarily given to the ATO. So there's lots of data matching that happen. And what happens is, just like you do a mail merge, the ATO will go, if this data and this data don't match, there'll be a please explain letter that will get sent out and then you've got to explain it. Now, there could be a very valid reason why it doesn't make sense to the ATO, but you've still got to go to the effort to basically explain it to them. Otherwise, you could have um, repercussions of additional tax to pay and penalties and things like that. 
So, since you've got to bring the income in, the beautiful thing about our tax law is if you try and earn assessable income or you earn assessable income, you can claim deductions. And that's what everyone gets excited about. Okay, so there's a number of deductions, so the number of deductions that you can you incur when you uh, receive income from the gig economy. And the rules about deductions I've just put up, this is the, the, basically the golden rules. You must have spent the money and it can't be reimbursed. The cost must be relating to doing the job and it can't be a private expense. So if you've gained uh, income from making cupcakes, the raw materials and things like that that you've used can be offset. So you only have to do the, in effect, the profit of those. Um, if some of the uh, expenses to do with personal, you then can apportion it. So if some of it, so if you've bought a whole kilo of flour or something for your cupcakes and you use some for personal, some for private, you just apportion it accordingly and using reasonable measures, okay? Um, and you've got to keep records. This is the big thing with people. I mean, I have clients that come to me and go, oh, Lisa, just put $1,000 down for this. And I go, it's not going to cut it. It's got to make sense, OK? So it's a, you've got to either hold the receipt or you've got to have a diary or it's got to, you, you've got to basically be able to justify it somehow. And the ATO will look for those rounding numbers. So if you're just going to claim $1,000, they'll go, mm, this looks like a bit of a guess. We can't put guesses in. OK, so it's very important to keep records. Now, some of the examples of what you could claim in the gig economy or, or any of the side hustles. Um, travel is probably a good one. The ATO lets you claim travel up to 5,000 kilometres without a great deal of record keeping. So you can basically look up on, on a map app and say, yeah, I've travelled so far to and from, say, the, the farmer's market or to and fro the client that you're going to assemble the IKEA furniture for or something like that. Um, based on the 2019 income year, which is what we're in now, um, it's 68 cents per kilometre you can claim. If you want to claim anything more than that, so 5,000 is the minimum, if you want to claim anything more than that, you need to keep a logbook. And that's a logbook for 12 weeks uh, over a five year period. And the logbook's just got to say opening and closing odometer reading um, and what were the purpose of the journey was. Um, you can claim your mobile phone. You can look at a percentage of a plan. So you're apportioning it for private and business use. I always tell my clients, if you've only got one phone, there's got to be some amount of private there. You know, you're going to be looking at Facebook and, and tweeting and doing things privately as well. So there's got to be some apportionment. Um, or you can claim up to $50 um, limited deduction uh, for, a, for mobile phone usage uh, when you're gaining accessible income. Uh, if you work out of home, so you're doing something creative and you're using some of your um, uh, home for that, you can claim 52 cents per hour. Okay, it's, you can claim other parts of uh, your home and things like that, uh, depending on if you've got a dedicated area and things like that, and there's some very strict rules. But the 55 cents per hour, um, if you do two or three hours worth of work at home a week, you can claim that as a deduction against the gig economy. Again, it's got to be related to earning the gig, that gig economy acceptable income. Um, laundry, like if you've got a logoed shirt or something like that, it's got to be a specific shirt or it's got to be uh, occupation specific uh, or protective clothing, you can claim some laundry allowance. So they're the kind of deductions. And they're kind of the deductions you can get if you're a salary and wage earner as well. It's just you can claim those that's related to the gig economy. Um, and any dedicated tools and equipment. So if you need that Allen key, you can claim that. Be aware though, um, and I, it, it comes down to, you know, if you're going to do something like uh, you're going to do some performance art. I've got a niece and she had a mermaid party and so a university student came to be a mermaid and she's got makeup and she's done her hair and everything like that. Haircuts, things like that, that's personal, you can't claim that. But her mermaid outfit is a costume, she could claim that. But if she was just going to wear, you know, just normal street clothes, you can't claim those, okay? So anything like that, you've, you can't do. All right, so they're the kind of deductions that you can claim. Uh, so in, in closing, before I pass on, um, I will uh, just mention that be very, very careful 
of claiming deductions against assessable income. One of the final tricks I'll just share with you is if you've earned $100 of assessable income and you want to claim more than $100 worth of deductions, you can't claim the offset, like negative gearing, which I know is very topical at the moment, you can't claim that offset against any salary and wages income. Okay, you need to quarantine it. So don't get over exuberant with the deductions. They need to be quarantined until you earn enough income. Okay, so now I'll pass on. Thanks. I've already introduced John, so. Yeah, that's all right. right. <laughs> Thanks, Lisa. Okay, so I'm, um, my job is to talk about employment uh, rights and the gig economy. Over 10 years ago, I think now, I was approached by some business uh, school students across the park. Um, they wanted to meet me for a coffee and said, told me they were developing a, a business concept uh, for one of their courses and they needed to you know, work out all the pros and cons of this business concept, including any labour law implications. I'm happy to meet you and um, sat down with them and their idea was basically a web-based uh, labour exchange platform. So um, a, a, a website where people could buy um, work from people willing to provide work for a fee. And I said, and they said, so what are the, you know, what are the issues here? And I said, well, it's fine, you know, as long as, as, long as the wage rates that are, or the payment rates are being set are, um, you know, a, a, a Accord with the legal minimum standards for employees. If that's what these workers are, then you, you know, it should be a, a reasonable, um, you know, business concept. And, they, and, and their response was, "Oh, but no, these 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 will just be people, you know, willing to work for whatever the market rate for that work will be, and they won't be employees." Um, so my advice was, "Well, you know, you you might have some issues there, depending on how the, those workers are classified." So. More than a decade on now, we've got a proliferation of these. I'm not saying these business school students were the first people to come up with these, uh, this idea, but they're obviously tapping into a trend that has now become very prevalent. Um, that, that is people working through these digital platforms, whether it's to provide transportation services or to deliver food and so on. Now, I don't want to overstate the extent of this issue. It's been estimated that only about 0.5% of Australians work through these services, these sort of platforms. Um, but nevertheless, it's a, you know, that's a growing number and it's a, a significant issue for those workers. Um, now, why is this an employment rights issue? Well, as I said at, at the outset, um, there, if, if in our legal system, um, we have certain labour protections that attach to a, a certain status or work status, and that is being in employment. If you're an employee, then you're entitled to a number of legal protections, like a, a minimum rate of, work, of pay for the, the work that you do, entitlements to sick leave, annual leave, in many cases, uh, working hour restrictions, and so on. But if you're not an employee or working as an independent contractor, then there are very few protections in terms of any minimum standards for your working conditions. Um, and uh, owners of digital platforms tend to try and characterise the work that's being done um, as being, um, or the workers that do the work as being independent contractors. So, or, or as not being people who are working for the owners of the digital platform. So, for example, Uber likes to try and characterise the drivers as independent entrepreneurs who are simply buying Uber's software to help them, those entrepreneurs, run their transportation business. But we, of course, when we take Ubers, just see drivers who are driving for Uber. We, um, we don't necessarily see that them as entrepreneurs who are running their own business and simply using Uber's software. Um, of course, there are attractions for workers in, in doing this sort of on-demand work. You just need a, a mobile phone, a vehicle of some sort. In the case of delivering food, it might just be a bike. Um, so there's a certain level of flexibility and um, I guess independence and ease to that. 
But there is a lot of evidence that those workers are being exploited um, when compared against people who are working as employees um, and re are regulated by the labour law system. So, for example, a survey done by the Transport Workers Union of Uber drivers who get, I think it's a 25% commission from every fare, found that on average they're earning about $16 per hour, uh, whereas the, the rock bottom national minimum wage in Australia is just under $19 at present and about to go up. Um, so some, some of those drivers are earning above the minimum, but many are, are not. Uh, so there's an issue there with, um, with the, the working conditions of these workers. And of course, it's not just wages, but what happens if they have an accident? Um, what if they get sick? Um, they're not entitled to sick leave and so on and so forth. Um, so the, I guess the legal issues that have come up in relation to platform, the platform economy and, and to the, um, these on-demand workers is, are they, are they really employees? So are these sham arrangements, uh, the platforms deliberately trying to disguise what's really an employment relationship, which therefore entitles the worker to these protections, um, or are these workers genuinely independent contractors? If they are genuinely independent contractors, do we nevertheless need to change our system to make sure they're entitled to minimum employment standards? At the moment, what we've got is a system which is very ad hoc. So people, workers, don't necessarily know whether or not they're entitled to be employees and entitled to those protections. And if the employer the, or the, the business, the platform, refuses to acknowledge their employees, the only way you can resolve that is to bring a legal challenge to try and determine that you're an employee. Um, and the test of whether or not you're an employee is, is not very clear because it depends on a number of different factors, one of which is the existence of a contract and what it describes you as. And of course, the platforms are very careful not to describe the workers in these businesses as employees. So, for example, in Uber, you're a partner or whatever. You're, you're certainly not an employee in those contracts. Now, that's not the be-all and end-all, but it, it does make for an uncertain legal environment. Um, in terms of responses from governments, there's currently a state government inquiry in Victoria into uh, the on-demand workforce, which will be looking at regulatory options in Victoria. At the federal level, depending on the result on Saturday, um, if it's the coalition coming back in, I don't think you'll see much change in terms of a federal approach. But the Labor Party has committed to ensuring that these workers uh, receive what they call industry standards in terms of working conditions. But for, for many of these workers in, in say, the transport industry, the, the industry standard be, would be what employees receive. So it suggests that a Labor government will make some, uh, will make some changes in that area um, if they are elected on Saturday and are able to get change through the Senate. Thank you. Thanks, Roger. Now, our uh, presenters have been uh, uh, somewhat uh, succinct, uh, <laughs> and uh, which is great because it leaves us uh, ample time uh, for any questions uh, that you may have. So um, I might move over here, and we have a roving mic. Uh, for any questions? And please uh, perhaps direct your question to one uh, of the... Yep. Could you uh, tell us a little bit about the cousin of the gig economy, and that's the black economy? Mm -hmm. I mean, we've always had the black economy. We've also had things like, you know, 100 years ago, Bob for job, where scouts would do jobs and you'd pay them. How do these... What's the continuum? How do these all... Can I go first, I prefer to call it the cash economy. Um, and I think, yes, I mean, there are... To, to some extent, the flexibility of these platforms, there's some resemblance to the ease of a cash economy where um, you're, you're doing deals off, off the books that may or may not accord with, with legal requirements. I suppose the difference, as, as Lisa's pointed out, is, is with the, the extent to which um, 
these platforms record data uh, and the way things are changed. But look, the, the cash economy is, is also a major problem for employment rights observance in that if, if employers or businesses can get away with it and use the cash economy, then there are also cases of underpayment of workers in that side of the economy. Yeah, the, a the ATO are doing a lot of work um, on trying to combat the cash economy. They're doing a lot of audits at the moment for various uh, uh, restaurants and things like that. I think that the tap mentality of just tapping, uh, everything's going into a bank account. If it's going into a bank account, it can get monitored by the ATO's data matching. But um, it's very tough to um, combat completely. There's, t there's uh, two things I'd like to say in addition. I think there's something like 25 $100 bills per, per person in Australia, and I haven't seen a $100 bill for quite a long time. So it's interesting to know where all those $100 notes are um, in terms of the black economy. Um, and the second thing is there's a lot of um, compliance burden that's going on to small business as well in terms of what you call single touch payroll, which everything will be getting recorded. So where they're trying to pick up people there is that um, you've got a worker that's not getting paid um, what they're entitled to. Uh, they're happy because they're still getting some DHS subsidy of some kind, so it's a win-win for both parties. But the single touch payroll initiative that's now compulsory as of 1 July 2019 for all businesses um, will slowly close down on that. Um, and can I yes, jump in? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> because I'm from Job Watch, everyone, and Job Watch is a community legal centre that operates across Victoria and also in Tassie and Queensland. And we receive lots of calls every year from people who are working in the gig economy. We are uh, an organisation for workers. Um, and certainly we get lots of queries from people who are working in the cash economy. Um, and that adds a whole extra level of uncertainty for them because um, they, don't, they don't have a clue about is my principal or employer, whatever we call them, is the business that I'm working for actually treating me as a contractor or as an employee. They, they have that extra level of um, uncertainty. And often they come to us thinking that they have absolutely no rights because of being treated as a cash in hand worker. Um, yep, on my right. I think there was another hand up before. Hi, thanks for the presentation. Um, I've got a tax question. So um, I run a photo tourism business as like a side hustle type thing. Um, and one of the places that I advertise is Airbnb and they take 20%, which is pretty high. I was wondering, can you claim that 20% fee as a deduction? Absolutely. So, as I said, anything, any income that you're, you need to bring in, yep. right, that you've earned, if there's an associated deduction att attached to that, definitely. So, even if it's like advertising, you're basically saying, okay, I'm putting myself out there, I'm trying to earn this income out of that, mm -hmm. so you claim a deduction against it. Okay. Um, and it's probably you get it net anyway, wouldn't you? Or yeah. Yeah, you get it in that anyway. Yeah. Um, the second is just to follow up, um, but can you recommend an accountant? <laughs> <laughs> There's plenty of good accountants out there. So I would just say get someone that's um, registered with one of the three associations, being a chartered accountant, a CPA, or, a, or with the Institute of Public Accountants. All right, thanks. I'll let you come talk to me later. No. <laughs> up the back. Uh, I want to ra raise a question uh, based on my observation. Uh, uh, I settled here 25 years ago, uh, finished uh, lots of study in Melbourne Uni, and then uh, uh, when I started as a, st a postgrad student here, I was aware there were all kinds of uh, provision. Uh, now, for example, there are uh, uh, either owners or somebody renting a flat, and, and you know, uh, bills very expensive, they like to get somebody to share the uh, flat or home. 
And then how to declare that income? And I was also aware there were some elderly people who, who want somebody to come into the home and do some work for them and charge maybe low rental or maybe free rental or something. And then over the years, I also looked into CAV, uh, about the rules and regulation. And I, I chased them, oh, were there any rules for homestay, you know? And they said, oh, we'll develop that, that. But I was not aware they have ever done that. So you know, uh, what I mean is rules and regulations didn't seem to be uh, very clear. And looking into the Melbourne Uni students' uh, uh, housing services, and normally they were not in the same page a as the government rule. And then it becomes very confusing, and, and people feel nervous about you know, dealing with these uh, rules and regulations. Uh, so, so I just wonder uh, how to deal with that, how to declare that angle, well, whether it's not necessary to do that, you know, homestay income, somebody to stay in the home, share the home, just, just to make enemies, you know, to pay off the, all those big bills. So from a tax perspective? <laughs> Yes, yeah, so I suppose there could be two perspectives. Yeah. Um, should the uh, owner or original occupier yeah. of the property be recognising the uh, value of the benefits in terms of services they receive and also perhaps if there is a payment and yeah. then whether uh, there could be an employment relationship was the other side. Yeah. So perhaps yeah. Lisa first. Yeah, so from a tax point of view, um, so it's basically if, if you're receiving accessible income or receiving a benefit that can be equivalent to cash, you need to bring it in. Um, and accordingly, as I said, with deductions, if, if they're um, using some of the electricity, for example, or you're providing tea, coffee, think about it like a, um, a, a motel. Um, you can deduct. Uh, the big thing where this arrangement is getting caught is with Airbnb, where um, it could be just a bedroom that people are actually renting out. And of course, the ATL are monitoring the Airbnb site and will be able to know if you've got your your, um, your room or your house up there on Airbnb, and they will know when it was rented for as well. So, uh, so to answer your question is yes, the income should be brought to account from a tax point of view, and even if it's in kind, or if it's in a, in even a bartering arrangement, it should be then determined by a cash equivalent type uh, calculation. So good luck with that. <laughs> John or Gabrielle, you can sort out um, on employment. Well, if, if someone's being provided with accommodation in lieu you know, as part payment or payment for labour, um, then that they they may be subject. They're likely to be subject to the Fair Work Act, which has rules about you know the amount of money people should be paid for work, and the capacity of employers to pay people other than in in money. Uh, and so um, that that sort of practice would you'd need to make sure it was in accordance with the. Fair Work Act in both senses that, that there was, you're able to prove that they're being paid more than the minimum wage for that job and that your practice of paying or the practice of paying them through accommodation is in accordance with the Act. But it all comes back to John's point about whether or not it's actually an employment relationship. Yeah. Because if it's not an employment relationship then those things don't apply, but if it is an employment relationship you must be paid wages and super, and um, you can't be just providing accommodation as a substitute for the wages. But, and, and if, but if the person is, is sort of live in, doing their only job at that place of where, at that place of residence, then they're likely to be an employee. If it's just one thing they're doing among many for different employers, then then it's might be more likely they're an independent contractor. So I've got a case on at the moment at Job Watch where someone was living on the premises and basically doing a whole lot of uh, jobs for the landlord. Um, and, and the landlord is arguing there was no employment relationship. You know, we were friends, I was helping him out. He didn't have any other accommodation. I gave him somewhere to live and he was just doing some other things for me. Um, and of course, we're arguing, no, no, this was an employment relationship. He needed to be paid wages and superannuation. These issues do come up. Are there 
Any other questions? Uh, yep, right in front of you. Hi, um, I think this question would go to all of you. Uh, I'm from the Student Peer Leader Network here at the university, and we offer a whole range of careers and employability advice, including a project on international students' employment um, and work rights here in Australia. And we know that um, a big part of the international student community joins the gig economy here. And I was wondering if you have any particular advice to this community? Yes, I'll start straight away. <laughs> <laughs> because one of the wonderful things is that um, we have a specific program. So we, you know, being a community legal centre, we've got some recurring funding, but also project specific funding. And one of the projects that we have on the go at the moment is specifically for international students. So that's being funded by the Victorian government, and it's a partnership project with some other community legal centres and Victorian legal aid. So it's called the International Students. Work Rights Legal Service, which is a very long name, but just to describe exactly what that legal service um, is for. And we have there's a Facebook page for it, there's a website, Study Melbourne Student Centre, um, which is located in Cardinal Lane, is a student hub specifically for international students, and they will always refer international students who've got any kind of work issues, including, of course, gig economy problems, um, to this legal service. And I'd just add that the Fair Work Ombudsman, I should have mentioned in my presentation, is the federal regulator of employment standards. Uh, and the FWO provides information about what people are entitled to and then monitors compliance. And it's bringing a case against Fedora at the moment, um, claiming that workers were um, not really independent contractors but employees. And even though Fedora is closed down in Australia, they're still pursuing them. Um, but uh, the FWO has a campaign focused on students and international students. And if you go down to the basement of the union, you'll see lots of posters up with where students can access information. So that's a, um, about their employment rights. So that's another yeah. source of information and advice. Yeah, and with international students, we need to determine, or they need to determine, whether they're what we call tax resident or not. And it could depend on their visa and things like that. So if they're considered a resident, um, a tax resident of Australia, they are taxed on their worldwide income in Australia. If they're not considered a tax resident of Australia, they're taxed on the Australian sourced income. So they need to be aware of that. And so they need to apply for a tax file number and lodge a tax return on 30 June annually. Other questions? Yep, up the back. Hello. Um, can you hear me? Um, I've just got a general question. So I heard from somewhere, this could be very wrong, that if your um, studies are related to some future employment of yours, that you can claim back ex like study expenses in your deductions. But then I asked someone else and they said no. <laughs> um, it, I don't want to be blatant and say it's usually considered too soon, okay? So the general rule about claiming any sort of education deductions is um, if you're employed and you're gaining accessible income and you're doing a course or something like that which is going to improve or increase your income, then it's usually deductible, okay? But like your hex fees... Most likely not. <laughs> Are they still called hex fees or fee help? I don't know. Fee. Yeah, okay. Fee help, sorry. Yep, and another question. Thanks for your presentation. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm an international student from China, and uh, I have found a survey uh, conducted by uh, New South Wales and the UTS in 2017. It's, it's international student, uh, like, 25% of international students uh, earn like 12 hours or below. 43% uh, of them like earn 15 or below. So I feel like student still, international students still uh, kind of in, uh, in the environment which is like not treated very fair. And 
uh, in terms of the uh, government and also university, do you think is there anything government can do? Because I feel international students, they have very vague position in terms of their visa and their study duty and, you know, they're living here by themselves, you know. Just just want, want to say if there anything uh, a government and the university can do uh, uh, like to further support or or do you think there other way we can support like really really help help us because we still have lots of students got this this situation. Well, I might start by just commenting on the fact that um, uh, there was a migrant workers task force set up. You might remember a couple of years ago um, there was a scandal. Uh, that broke out because of a Four Corners report into um, lots of international students working for the 7-Eleven franchises and being terribly exploited. And so as a result of that, the then Federal Minister Michaelia Cash set up um, this migrant workers task force that was headed up by Alan Fells. And they only just um, put in their final report a little while ago that was uh, published, made public, a couple of months ago, I'd say, I think about six weeks ago or eight yeah, weeks ago. Okay. And um, so in that report, there are a number of recommendations, very good recommendations about how we can improve the situation. And they're very wide ranging from, you know, the information that international students should receive even offshore, even before arriving in Australia, um, about their work rights and about who to go to for help when they arrive in Australia. Um, through to uh, what enforcement mechanisms we should have for international students to be able to, and other temporary migrant workers, not just international students, um, but to try and make things easier to enforce employment rights. Um, look, it's a challenging area because, because international students often worry, you know, it, a, are they aware they're being underpaid? And if they are, they often worry, look, if I complain, am I going to lose my job? My, you know, there's often the threat of losing your visa, whether or not that's actually true um, from employers. Um, and then often fear of, you know, so even though the Fair Work Ombudsman is, is there to help, you know, you realise your proper rights or job watch, Students are often worried about going to the government to to help, but um, uh, certainly the the FWO, if people are willing to make a complaint, they can keep it confidential, uh, and they may be an avenue for help. But they they can't do although they know that this is happening, unless they've got evidence that a particular employer is only paying. I, mean, I think the ombudsman knows that there's a going rate in Chinatown, which is, for example, which is well under the um, minimum wage. But but they need evidence that individual employers are not paying the legal minimum, and that requires a student willing to come come to them and say, you know, I I'm, I think I'm being underpaid, and this is my own employer, and I'm happy for you to do something about it. Um, I mean, I think specifically in the area of gig economy, there, there are certain things that we could be doing better, and one of them is to, um, to clarify for international students who have, uh, in my view, unfortunately, currently the um, 40 hours a fortnight limitation on work rights, and, um, and so many international students come to the uh, legal service that I mentioned before, the International Students' Work Rights Legal Service, and one of the questions is, I'm working you know, in the gig economy, let's say, so I'm available through this platform way more hours than I actually earn money for, but I don't know what actually counts for the purpose of the Migration Act, what counts as work, you know, what's going to be considered work as part of those 40 hours. So there's lots of questions, lots of uncertainty um, and thing, issues that we need to work through. Thank you. I think there was another question. Did you... Hello, I'm Melbourne Uni alumni. Um, I may be travelling in the next year or two for an extended period in Europe. Um, I noticed that um, you made a comment about worldwide taxable income for Australian ta tax residents. I'm an Australian citizen, and so when I relocate and I become a non-resident for tax purposes, um, 
what happens there? Because to some extent, in the gig economy, my reputation or my status on certain sites, Airbnb, yeah. um, whatever, all those things are, are kind of carried with me, but with a you, you're an Australian yeah. stamp on it because it originated from that site. Um, I mean, to some extent, I can try to change it, but it's linked to all of that information that I've entered. Yeah. And unless I start a whole new account and therefore lose that status that I've gained over the years, um, mm. do you have any <laughs> thoughts about that in terms of um, if I earn, if I yeah. move to Europe and I start earning, um, I set up an Airbnb there, uh, mm. and the money's being funneled back into Australia, Mm-hmm. Or even if I don't funnel it back into Australia, and the ATA has all, all this information. What what's the? I, I didn't really understand more fully what you meant by the worldwide taxable income. I've never yeah. lived overseas. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'll try. I'll try. I'll just give you a flavour of it. Um, it's very difficult to, um, if you're Australian domiciled, it's very hard for you to be a non-resident for tax purposes. There's a number of tests and it's not one of those ticker box exercises where you go, you know, if I get six out of ten, I'm an Australian resident. It's very quite complex and there's about four tests that need to be applied um, to do that. So um, if you're travelling and you've still got some sort of connection back in Australia, it's highly likely you'll still be Australian tax resident and then be taxed on your worldwide income no matter where it comes from. Okay, so you need to look through. In your case, you can go onto the ATO and there's nice sites to say, will I still be Australian tax resident? And the way that I look at it, the house always wins. So the ATO wants you to be taxed on the, on the worldwide income. So therefore, these, these tools that are on the ATO site usually fall on the side of the house. Um, so that's one thing. Uh, then it's always difficult with the way that it's coming through, and it is quite complex, is what would be considered the country of source of income, if that's what you're, you are alluding to with your question. So is it where you perform the work, where the money gets paid, um, where the platform is, like where your status is, you know, on Facebook, LinkedIn, WhatsApp or whatever. So there's, it is quite complex. So it's hard to give you a definitive answer, but you just need to look at all the possibilities. But for you, I would start with, OK, you're travelling overseas, how long are you going to be away? jump on the ATO website tool and say, will I, st- will I still be Australian tax resident? Because that takes the confusion away. Right, so if I go over and work uh, on a work holiday visit in London, mm-hmm. um, <laughs> and that income of there, to some extent, if I spend the entire tax year away from the 2nd of June, uh, July through the yeah. 29th of uh, June, um, well, yeah, no, it's still very complex because, um, okay, the other rule is you shouldn't get double taxed. So this is why the big franking credit argument's coming out as well. Um, and in the UK, they have a different financial year to us. So I would say if you're going to do that, go to an accountant over in the UK and it'll sort it out. And usually there's some sort of arbitrage of who gets what we call the taxing rights. Sorry for being complex, but the taxing rights in each country. So yeah, if you're going to do that, you definitely need to go and see a tax person over in the UK. Thank you. I'm That's right. Yes. Oh, don't even go down there. Yeah, if you're born in the US, you're meant to be putting in a US tax return and good luck with that. Even um, I've got people that are trying to be fulfilled by Amazon businesses. Yeah. So they're doing something over in China, drop shipping it into a warehouse in the US. And to be able to clear customs, they're getting themselves a US tax file number and it's opening up a huge Pandora's box of tax, US tax obligations. So I think that's where I was trying to get to with my talk, that even if you, know, you just decide to Uber drive for one day, you've got huge compliance obligations. The lady up there that's renting out her house or intending to rent out her house or thinking about it, if that's your main residence that isn't taxed at all and you're going to start earning income from that house, all of a sudden that main residence tax-free environment could become taxable. So even you know, if you do it once, it could cause you some grief. So good luck. Enjoy your trip. We have time for perhaps one very short question. If, uh... It's only a short one. Um, you mentioned hobbies before, so hypothetically, if we had students here in the national and domestic that were um, taking advantage of arrangements where they were doing in sport, um, acting as officials and or coaches, 
under loose arrangements which may or may not consider them as contractors. The, the word hobby is always bandied about yeah, yeah. in terms of them. And I'm fairly sure, in fact, I know that a lot of them are being paid in situations where they're, yeah. Yeah. That was my under the, yeah. Yeah, which Blackly. I guess is yeah. like a gig economy. Where do they yeah. fit in and where does that, the word hobby, which is bandied about? Um, yeah, it's, I'm finding it's very, very hard now with the gig economy come in. Hobby was always something like, um, yeah, like, I used to indoor cricket umpire or something like that as a kid, you know, it's that sort of thing, and, but that's back in the 80s. Um, I think now with the gig economy, the, if you're gaining income from personal exertion, no matter whether it's a hobby, consider it to be a pastime or you enjoy doing it or something like that, it's really just coming into the tax net that way. I find that when you look on the balance of probabilities, most of the income that's coming in is not hobby related. It's very much, it's personal exertion, therefore it needs to come into the Australian tax net. In okay. other words, you've got to declare it on your tax return. Yeah. And a responsibility of the, of the person doing the work. Or yeah, and you know, as we were talking about the black economy or the cash economy or whatever, it's you've still received the money whether it goes through a bank account or not. Okay. Thanks. And there'd be similar issues that uh, there was a, a soccer coach who sued the Football Federation of Victoria a couple of years ago because in soccer I know it tends to be just you know for coaching and so on some sort of flat rate or annual fee but um, it, but they're performing work you know in for remuneration so um, are they an employer independent contractor they need to get paid their super and then if we're, <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I know, but um, it... it it's not determinative. It's not determinative, yeah. The, the term honorarium is generally used for a volunteer arrangement where you receive a small payment in recognition of your service and part of what makes it an honorarium is that it actually bears no relationship to an employment or a yeah. what would be an appropriate wage. So. Once things get close to, but not quite, a wage, that's where things start to be dodgy. Whereas an honorarium might be um, you sit on a not for profit board or you volunteer at a soccer club and they give you, um, I don't know, um, a hundred dollar gift voucher. Yeah, gift voucher, yeah. Mm. So it bears no relationship mm. to the time you put in. It's a recognition of service. Mm. And who makes that distinction? From a tax point of view, it's the taxpayer. Yeah. I think the key point here, because we do need to wind up, is that the use by the, the parties to the arrangement of a particular word does not necessarily dictate the nature of their relationship. Is that mm. a fair...? Mm. So they might call themselves an employee, mm. but they're not actually, or they might call themselves a partner, but they're actually mm. an employee. So. Mm. Um, the use of honorarium is one thing that's, like John said earlier, one thing that's mm. taken into account, but it doesn't necessarily determine the outcome. Mm. And the FWO has been cracking down on so-called volunteering and unpaid work. They just look at is this, is this, you know, is this an employment relationship or that should be covered by the Fair Work Act? In which case, that that's what you need to be observing, not not. Whatever you want to, you know, you might want to call title. it. Yeah. yeah. Now, unfortunately, that's uh, the end of our time. But um, just there's obviously uh, uh, many issues that arise with respect to the gig economy, and they're not going to go away. Um, if you are interested in exploring or have, obtaining assistance uh, from the tax clinic. Um, uh, with respect to some of those issues or other tax matters, uh, as I said at the start, please feel free to uh, contact and uh, have a chat with our uh, people out the front uh, and just register your interest. Um, and uh, finally, I'd just like to uh, ask for a, a, a um, sign of appreciation in the usual way for the uh, very um, useful information we've obtained from our three presenters, Lisa, John and Gabrielle. Uh, so if you could just uh, show your thanks. Thank you. Thank you.